Hello class. Now we're going to talk about the appendicular skeleton, the bones of your arms and your legs. So let's just get right to it. All right, so um, good, good stuff. Uh, we'll see um, when we look at our arms and our legs, they evolve differently. If you look at a gibbon or even a chimp, their arms and legs are about the same length. And ours, our legs are longer. Our feet, you know, have evolved for locomotion, whereas our hands for more flexibility. Very similar though, obviously. They have the same single bone, paired bones, carpals and tarsals, phalanges, the same number. So you can tell that the front and hind limbs um, were very similar. And then in humans, they've, they've diverged for different functions. Yeah. I'm looking here at the right at a, looks like a deer leg. And you can see, just like a, in lab, I'll show you a, a moose femur. It's not that much bigger than a human femur, even though me, moose are a lot taller. Meese, I almost said meese. Um, moose are a lot taller. So what you get is that you can see it's a pretty uh, uh, similar looking um, uh, uh, tibia. They don't really have a fibula. But this, you see their ankles get longer too. So they, that's how they really, uh, lengthen their limbs and for those of you sprinters and runners who want to get the best speed speed is going to be stride length times how many strides per minute how fast you can move your leg so a longer legged person can run faster if they can move the leg at the same speed because each stride is longer right so that's how animals like uh, horses and giraffes and moose and deer they get faster speed is by lengthening the limbs and they don't do it with the femur or the humerus, they do it with the distal part. Their, their ankles get longer, they're even on their toes, on their very tippy toes in the case of a deer or a horse. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about joints too. We'll talk about how deer even have like a low gear and a high gear for when they get going and they're going faster, working different muscles. And it's all physics having to do with the joints, where the muscles are attached, the fulcrum, where the force is put. All right, let's get right to it. So we'll start with the arms, the upper limbs. And uh, technically this is your arm, this is your forearm, wrist, hands, right? Palm, hands, um, digits. Um, and so we look at our upper limb, it's interesting. Uh, in the back, it's not connected. Your scapula are just floating in your back, right? On your ribs. And you can you know, raise them, lower them. You can uh, retract them or protract them. Uh, rotate them so those scapula are really mobile and then in front of your collarbones the clavicles and those are also very mobile too we'll, we'll show you that how see they're making a full circle i can feel my collarbones but this is this uh girdle we call it the, the pectoral girdle for your upper limbs and that's going to attach your your arm to your body it's going to be in the scapula as the joint and your clavicles or collarbones are these uh struts that keep our arms apart and so we can swing from trees, throw things, and it, it keeps them apart like this. So there's a nice picture. You can see uh, your clavicles, and you can see your scapula behind, and you see your humerus, or your arm bone, how it articulates in that glenoid fossa of the scapula. And there's lots of movement. Your arm can move abduct, adduct, circumduct, uh, flex, extend, all these things. So. A lot of movement in that shoulder joint, right? So clavicles, yeah, they look like, uh, it means key. And I'm looking at that shape and in lab, I'll have you give you one and say, is it a right or a left? And so just give you some practice. If you, if you notice that the, uh, the medial part of it is more kind of roundish and that's in the sternoclavicular joint. And then as it goes out, it has kind of like this, this S shaped and it's flatter out here by your acromium on your scapula. So you'll see that shape, but the top is pretty smooth. The underside's rougher because there's muscles attached at the bottom. But those are those, those struts. And because they, they're, they're keeping the arms out, if you have a, a power, if they're, this bone, if it's uh, force is put on it, if you're slammed into the ground, it can easily break. It's a very commonly broken bone. Yeah, and so again, acromial, wait, this is the sternal end and the acromial end. And there's lots of ligaments that keep those stable, 
although you can dislocate either end of that. Uh, you can, the clavicles can, or break it. Usually breaks about in the middle. Beautiful. But yeah, very obvious. And uh, clavicles in uh, people that do manual labor are solid. You know, if you're working your arms and that stress is always on it, the bone responds. And if you're more sedentary or work office job, your clavicles are more slender. All right, your scapula back there. Um, yeah, these wings that sit in the back. Um, you take a look at them. Cool, not connected uh, uh, immediately at all. You see that spine that obviously goes through it. And that spine is gonna separate into a supraspinous depression and an infraspinous depression. And then the underside of it, or the anterior part is also a depression. And on there will be muscles, your rotator cuff muscles that will go from the scapula onto your humerus to give you stability when you're pitching or, or moving your arm. So looking at the anatomy, uh, you guys see uh, a spine. Again, it separates it into a fossa is a depression, a fossa, F-O-S-S-A. And there's a infraspinous and supraspinous depressions. And those muscles are called supraspinatus, infraspinatus and then subscapularis on the underside. So the muscle name's pretty easy if you know the bone. At the end of the spine is your acromion process. It's the, what you feel on your shoulder out here. And then coming anteriorly is this uh, coracoid process. Kind of looks like a, a crow's beak. Kind of looks like a little, little beak, sort of. Um, yeah, and then, uh, this little saucer-like part that sticks out will be the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. And that is the socket that your arm goes in, the humerus goes in. It looks really small here. In life, you have a labrum or kind of a lip around it that deepens it a little bit, but this is a very unstable joint. Your shoulder can dislocate uh, pretty easily. Yeah, and so, Feel your shoulder and allow, you know, have you guys make sure you know, oh, okay, there it is. This is my acromion. Uh, it comes out, it kind of makes a roof over the shoulder joint. Um, yeah, and that's where the, uh, the clavicle will come. And there'll be ligaments that connect it, the acromial end of the clavicle, as opposed to the sternal end. Lots of ligaments on here. Oh, yeah. And the names are actually pretty easy if you look at it, like coracohumeral from the coracoid process to the humerus. Um, coracoacromial, you know, coracoid to acromial process, yeah. Acromioclavicular, from the acromion to the clavicle. So these, there's all kinds of ligaments, but their names really make sense. If you know the anatomy of the bones, the ligaments are just named from that. So some of this movement of the clavicle, I mean, hold on to your collarbone and then just rotate your arm. Oh my God, that clavicle goes like this. You know, it's connected here in your sternum, but my gosh, when you move your arm, it's just rotating around it. So all kinds of movement at this uh, sternoclavicular joint here. And um, when we raise our arms to get a can of soup from the top shelf, something like that, you can see here that if I, if I kept my scapula steady and I just tried to raise my arm, I can only go so far. But then if I let my scapula rotate, I can go the rest of the way. So it is two to one. If I move my arm from the down position to the up position, 180 degrees, uh, 120 degrees is just the humerus moving in the socket. But then I got to rotate my scapula to finish it off the other 60 degrees. Yeah, I want you guys to understand that concept. When you want to move your arm up, you've got to, your scapula will tilt up also. So the scapula can can retract, can protract, can rotate either direction, can elevate or depress. So, you know, you feel that, you know, you, you work your traps, you're gonna do like, um, um, what's this called? Uh, oh my gosh, shrugs, you do shrugs, yeah. And so you're moving your scapula up. And so you got uh, muscles that do that. All right, just some pictures. You can see some x-rays, gorgeous. You, you guys take a look at this and see, all right, yeah. I recognize the humerus. Here's the head of the humerus. And then we just talked about, what's this depression? What's the socket? It's the glenoid fossa. And then what's this bony extension of the spine that kind of covers it? 
the acromial process. And then here you can see the, uh, the little beak-like thing coming in, coracoid process. And that will be your, your pec minor will attach onto it and the short head of your biceps. So the coracoid has some muscles attached to it and, and one other. Oh, my drawing, my lines mess it up. All right. But here we're seeing a, a, a mid shaft clavicular fracture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you fracture it, you're going to be able to just move your arm way more than it should inward because the clavicle is keeping it out there. Ah, oh, and here they, they've driven their arm up and broken the acromion. And here's a dislocation, a shoulder dislocation. We'll talk more when I do the joints, but here you can see normally the shoulder is going to dislocate downward, downward and anterior, downward and posterior, because up is hard because you've got that acromion usually stopping it. So a dislocation is usually down. And here's another where the, the head of the humerus is pulled away from the glenoid fossa. So that's an issue too. And once you have this dislocation, it often, the, the ligaments, everything gets, gets lax and loose and if they can pop it back, but then you might be more likely to get other dislocations in the future. All right. Oh, I have a, a video. I'll show you a guy that um, has no clavicles. Let's see, let me just stop showing. Let's see here. Actually, you don't want to see that. You want to see. Oh. This guy. I'll see you can see this. I understand you have a very unique skill. Yeah. Uh, when I was born, I was born without collarbones. It's actually hereditary in my family. There's four of us. Uh -huh. Not having collarbones, it allows me to do this. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> so I can fit Does through that crowds. Hurt? No, it doesn't hurt. I feel no pain whatsoever. So I, cause, so this is why I can't do it because yeah. I have collarbones. You're, it's blocking me. Can you do that one more time? Yeah. Oh. So you say you, you can fit through crowds. So if you're walking through like a, you know, crowded yeah. street, you just go. Oh. I hope you could see that. I hope there was sound. I'm not exactly sure, but if not, Google no clavicles um, crush can. You can even like crush a beer can between or a Coke can uh, between your clavicles like that. So Yes, so that's the point of the clavicles. You can see without them, you can move your two um, shoulders together in the front. And that actor, that kid from Stranger Things, he has that also, he does have clavicles. All right, let's move on to the limb. And so you guys know your humerus, your radius, your ulna, your carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. So let's, let's, let's take a look at them. So they're all right here, right? So you have a single bone, paired bones, a whole bunch of little bones and then in, in your hand. All right, so the humerus is a, is a quite a long bone. I can think your tibia is slightly longer and certainly heavier. It's more dense. Your lower limb is carrying all your body weight, so the bone's a little denser. But humerus is still a pretty big bone. You can see it has a big head, huge hemispherical head, so lots of movement up here. And then distally, you'll see the humerus is really expanded. It really goes wide down there. And then uh, obviously the muscles, the biceps and triceps will be uh, working on that elbow joint. Yeah, and so anatomy wise, we talk about uh, the head is huge, has this huge hemispherical head. So again, it, lots of range of movement. And then uh, the real neck, the anatomical neck is right behind it. But then we also, we talk about a surgical neck being here because it's never, hardly ever gonna break at that anatomical neck. It's gonna break down a little bit lower, so. That's the difference between those necks. And you look just uh, beneath the head, you're gonna have a greater tubercle and a, and a lesser tubercle. And between it's a little intertubicular groove. 
And that's where muscle attachments will attach there. And then that groove, the long head of biceps goes through that groove. And the short head just takes a shortcut to your coracoid process. Yeah, and you're looking at it, I'm going down the shaft here and I see about a third of the way, a little bit further down is a, is a rough patch. And that's the deltoid tuberosity. So the muscle of your shoulder is your deltoid and it's gonna come over your shoulder and attach there. And so if you have big deltoids, you're gonna have a rougher patch on the back of your, uh, the outside of your humerus about a third of the way down. And then distally, look how wide it is. And two things going on. One, you have two bones articulating, both the radius and ulna, but mostly all your forearm muscles, the forearm muscles, they're gonna be attached off of this uh, distal part of your humerus and they go down to your wrist and your fingers. So all these forearm muscles need space to attach. And so you have, we call the epicondyles where the, the bone flares out on either side of the condyles. The condyles are the smooth areas that where it articulates. The epicondyles are the outside of that. Cool. You look at the humerus, there's a little divot in the front, but there's a big divot in the back. And that fossa or depression is called the olecranon fossa. And your, um, your ulna is going to, the olecranon is going to stop in that little fossa. All right. Looking at the forearm, you have two bones, paired bones. And the thumb side is always radius. I feel this is my radial pulse. There's a radial artery, radial nerve. And on my pinky side is always the ulna. You have an ulna artery, ulna nerve. So just memorize that, thumb is always radius. And uh, the radius is the one that moves. The top of it looks like a circle. A big bump right there. And uh, this is going to rotate and your radius will rotate as you pronate and supinate your forearm. We'll talk about that in a minute. And you got a big old bump here too. That's your radial tuberosity, big bump and that's the tendon of biceps is going to uh, insert. And we'll talk about, in the muscle lecture, I'll talk about your biceps and how, um, in fact, when you do curls, you can really only engage the biceps when your hand is supinated. Because when your hand is, is pronated, when it's, the bones are twisted, that tendon of biceps is kind of twisted around and it's kind of lax. So if you do a curl, you tend to move to, to um, uh, supinate if you're using your biceps. So just a little preview on that. So we're seeing the bones, you see how the radius is the insertion of your biceps and the radius moves around. So when you really want to do curls, you've got to uh, get that, uh, that, that radius facing the right way. Yeah. And at the, the distal end of both the radius and ulna, there's a styloid process. So when you have a uh, pointy little process, it's a styloid process like we had in the temporal bone in the skull. And the ulna is a longer bone. And if you notice the head of the radius and the head of the ulna are different ends. Um, the, the ulna is the stable bone, it's on the pinky side. While the radius is rotating around, the ulna always keeps its position. And it kind of looks like an ice cream scoop on one end of it. Because uh, whereas the head of the radius goes in a little, a little circle on the humerus and rotates around, the ulna has a, little, uh, has a little notch and that fits in this little pulley and it works as a hinge. Yep. And this, this end is called the olecranon. That's what I'm hitting my elbow. That is the olecranon process of your ulna that you hit. And uh, it fits in the olecranon fossa in the back of your humerus so that you don't hyperextend your arm. It just kind of a stop. Beautiful. And then when I look at the ulna, there's also a little notch here in the medial side. And that's where the head of the radius fits in. And there'll be a, a ligament that goes around here that keeps the radius against it so it can rotate and it doesn't, you know, move apart from the, the other bone. And here's these two terms of movement. Whenever you put your hand out, like anatomical position, it's supinate. When you cross the bones, you're pronating. And I think of it as I want a bowl of soup. So I put my hand out for a bowl of soup. The other way it would dump the soup over. So supination, pronation. You'll hear these terms also in the, in the foot. You guys are runners and you look at shoes and, and how your feet, you can, you can be a pronator or supinator. It's similar, but it's not exactly the same, but it has to do with 
your foot going inward or outward. It's dramatic in your arm, the bones cross. All right, hands and feet. Uh, the feet we call the pests, you know, pedestrian, um, podiatrist, you know, related to that. that. Manus for the hand, your manus, uh, manual labor, manual transmission on a car means using your hands. It's your hands are the manus. Yeah. And uh, I want you guys to know the digits. We number them, remember them always. Your, uh, your thumb or your big toe is one, two, three, four, and your little toe and your pinky is digit five. Got it? One, digit one, digit two. I won't give you digit three, four, and five. How's that? Um, and then the phalanges are your finger bones. They're phalanges whether they're toes or fingers. They're all phalanges. And um, your uh, thumb or your big toe is going to have just two digits, phalanges. It's going to have sorry, two phalanges, a proximal and a distal. But the other, your other fingers have three, proximal, distal, and a middle. So I want you to be able to, to name, if I tell you any one of these bones, give me the exact name for it. So I'll circle one here. So you know it's digit four, right? So that is the middle phalange of digit four. And if I ask you, what is the smallest phalange? It'd be the distal phalange of digit five, which is your smallest one, okay? I think. And then the metacarpals make up your palm and they're also numbered one through five. So it looks like metacarpal two looks like it's the longest. What do you guys think? Your toes and your fingers. Now you can you can um, be able to to name every one of those those um, um, bones. Yeah, when we look at joints over here. This joint is going to be my metacarpal phalangeal joint, and then between my fingers would be my interphalangeal joints. And there's two in most digits. Your thumb only has one interphalangeal joint. Yeah, so looking at your hands, your phalanges are the fingers. Your metacarpals will be in your palm, and then your carpals will be here in your wrist. And radius, always thumb side. Yes, well, the carpal bones, there's eight of them in your wrist, and, and you can learn them, feel free, but I'm just, I, I won't test you on them because it's just adding a little too much, I decided. Um, but there's two rows of four little, short little bones that make up your carpals or your wrist bones. And of course you have five metacarpals, one through five, one through five, and then the phalanges. And if you add them up, four times three is 12, plus the two in the thumb is 14 phalange bones in each hand and foot. So if you add it up, 14 plus five metacarpals would be 19 plus eight, I count 27. I count 27 bones in one hand. So in two hands, it would be 27 times two, 54, right? So 54, yeah, so we're talking, let's say it's like 50, and then you count your feet, we average like another 50. So of those 206 bones in your body, we're getting near almost half is the, in the hands of the feet. So that's where all these, the bones really add up. You got a bunch of uh, 24 ribs, and then the vertebrae. So that's where your bones come from. Again, you don't need to memorize these, but you look at your carpal bones. Uh, if you get a broken wrist, it's often this end of the radius or the scaphoid bone. Uh, it tends to break quite a bit. Yeah. All right, we get to the foot last. Um, now let's, let's work in the lower limb. We'll go from the top down. So this is your pelvic bones. Um, I look at these pelvic bones and I compare it to our uh, chimps and nearest ancestors and, and we walk upright, completely upright. So our, our, our pelvis is, is flat in this way and quite uh, powerful, uh, quite uh, robust because we have all of our locomotion on just two legs instead of four. And uh, it's big and wide for our gluteal muscles, our leg muscles will attach onto there. We got big, we have big butts and big calves, humans do. Um, yeah. And I see a nice little cage to protecting some of our, our organs, our, our bladder, ovaries, things that are down there low too. 
All right, here's a, an infant's uh, x-ray. And now you can see that these two pelvic bones are really made up of three bones, right? Ilium, ischium, pubis. And you can see they come together in that acetabulum or the hip socket. You can't see that here, but they do. Um, you also see even the, this big cartilage here in the, the femur, right? So this is definitely the bones are still growing. All right, so these two pelvic bones, they're also called coxal or anominate bones, although I don't use those terms ever, but I call them the, the, the two pelvic bones. Um, yeah, and you can see this protection, uh, supporting all the weight from your lower limbs goes through the pelvis to, to hit your axial skeleton. And then that wideness, that, that big flaring of the ilium there for attachment of muscles to go to your, your legs. Yeah, and anatomy-wise, uh, this hip socket is called the acetabulum. And vinegar is acetic acid. And the Greeks thought it looked like a vinegar cup that they would put on their table during dinner. They would dip their meat in some vinegar. So that's acetabulum means vinegar cup. So, uh, And in real life, that cup um, is even deeper because you have a labrum, uh, a cartilage lip around it, making it even deeper. So that head of the femur is nicely deep in that socket. And this doesn't dislocate very easily at all. We'll talk about that with the joints. And then you can see the three bones, the ilium, ischium, pubis. The ilium is the biggest, makes up when you feel your hips up high. Uh, your pubis is what comes in front. And then you sit on your ischium. Your ischium is in the back. But all three come together in this acetabulum. It's called the triradiate cartilage, like a peace sign. Where, where, uh, I don't know the exact age, but uh, when you look in there, that's, that cartilage eventually will fuse and it looks like just one bone. In terms of some anatomy, uh, the iliac crest comes up. You can feel your iliac crest on top. You can feel a little point in front here. Uh, your ischium in the back, I want you to know it has a big tuberosity on it, real rough area back there. And that's what you sit on. When you, when you sit down, there's those two bony points are your ischium. And then your pubis is in front and uh, they come together to make this, this angle too that we'll talk about in males, it's narrow, or females, it's wider. Uh, pubic symphysis is where it comes together. There's some uh, fibrocartilage holding them together. And then this big obvious hole here is the obturator foramen. And it's covered over to membrane and life and there's muscle on either side and there's an obturator nerve that goes through it. All right, so you look at the pelvis, you can, you can draw a line, kind of line here. Um, the sacrum, where it begins, we call it the promontory, which is a promontory is where maybe you go and park and have a good view of the, the lake and the valley along. So promontory is a place where you sit up and you look around. And so that's on your sacrum, you can look around inside your pelvis there. And uh, you bring it around the front. And that's kind of, you look at that as being uh, uh, the pelvic inlet like the outlet is like where the baby would come out. And then everything above that is, is the false pelvis. Below it is more protected. That'll be your true pelvis, you know, below this pelvic brim. And uh, yeah, so down in here, it's well protected. Your sacrum in the back and all the pelvic bones here. And that false pelvis, less protection. In the back, you'd have your lumbar vertebrae, you got your ilium protecting you. In the front is just your abdominal muscles, you know, providing uh, protection. So yeah, when you look at your pelvis, the true pelvis is deep below that brim. And then the false pelvis is above, with the anterior part just being your, your ab muscles. Oh, this shows a male and female pelvis. Uh, I'll show another slide on that, but see this, this, this ar pubic arch or pubic angle is, is much wider in females. Well, I'll show you right here. Um, and, and the big, uh, the big, uh, how do I say this? The big, uh, there's a huge evolutionary um, disadvantage to being a woman and having too small of a pelvis. Therefore, you don't see that because those genes won't be passed on. Because during childbirth, before ages of cesarean sections now, um, if the pelvis was too narrow in a woman and she had a baby that was too big, it wouldn't get born and the, the baby and the mother would die in childbirth usually. And so big selection to women having 
a big enough opening so that uh, babies can safely pass through there. And men don't have that um, restriction at all. Um, and so women necessarily have wider pelvises and especially that pelvic outlet is gonna be a bigger opening than men. Um, and so there's many things, uh, clues that tell you if you look at a pelvis, whether it's male or female, and there's, there's, it's, it's all a bell curve, there's overlap. So there's no um, one thing that tells you male or female, but it's looking at the, the, um, um, the group of, uh, of variables will tell you male or female generally. Um, a male pelvis is generally rougher and, and heavier and thicker for more muscle mass. And then this angle is probably the best. You can see males have a narrower angle because women necessarily have a wider pelvis. The ilium is more flared. And then you can look at this shape, uh, it differs, and then uh, the acetabulum is deeper in men. There's all kinds of things. Again, none of them is completely diagnostic, but looking at the totality, you can tell a sex of a skeleton easiest by looking at the pelvis. Yeah, you can look at that. And if you look at a, a female, they'll never have the, the, the sacrum and the coccyx tilted way in. It's always gonna be out in order to leave enough room for uh, passage of a, of a baby. Yeah. And uh, during child, uh, before childbirth, uh, uh, obstetrician will, will, will measure vaginally, will measure uh, this distance between these spines and this distance uh, just to make sure it's, you have enough room. And if you don't, these days, just do a C-section. But uh, obviously before that, it was a, a huge problem. All right, let's move down from the pelvis. Um, oh, you guys, there's a turkeys. You see the turkeys? I just pointed you away. Yeah, we got a, a whole family of turkeys. God, they're really they're growing up fast. All right. Um, I digress. All right, so look at your lower limb. The big bone, like your humerus, is be your femur. That's the, the, the longest bone in your body. And then y'all know you got your tibia, that's the weight bearing bone. Your fibula is lateral and it's kind of wimpy. And then instead of carpals, we have tarsals, and then metatarsals instead of metacarpals and then phalanges are phalanges. And then we have the sesamoid bone, which I'll talk about, your, your kneecap or patella right in front. All right, so this femur, uh, it's about a quarter of your height. So if they find a femur, they can measure it, times four is about how tall that person was. Uh, massive bone, obviously. And just bringing back the male and female hips thing, you can see here too that with wider hips, you're gonna have more of an angle of the femur. And so real interesting. And if the angle is too extreme, you could even cause knee problems where you can see it has to come down and fit this plateau of your, your tibia uh, just right so that it's not leaning one end or the other. So being knock kneed or bow legged or that angle is gonna, um, influence knee issues. Look at the anatomy of the femur, awesome bone, love a femur. You can see the head, the neck, the osteoporosis, that's what breaks that broken hip, right? And then it have huge, these huge tubercles. This is a greater and lesser trochanter. Trochanter is like a big tuberosity. And look at now the front of a femur, you can see strong, strong bone. And then down here, um, you will see a medial and lateral condyle. Those are gonna fit on the tibia. I'll talk about the knee joint. They'll fit right on the tibia, yeah. And then in the front, you have a patellar surface where the patella slides up and down on that. You know, in front, this will be your big quadriceps muscles, right? Big front of your leg. And then it's gonna hit the, the tendon's gonna go onto this uh, um, um, patella. And then that's gonna attach down to your tibial tuberosity. So when you kick. Yeah. I'm looking at the back of the femur here. You get there's a line here. Um, I don't think I won't have to know that. What are we doing? And then so the condyles are at the bottom. There's a medial lateral. The expanded part of the sides, just like right in the elbow, will be the epicondyles, and that's for muscle attachment. Ah, some pictures of broken femur. 
that's a yeah you gotta well, one of you talked about in lab having broken your femur but that's that one you gotta uh, work hard to break that I, I broke my tibia fibula breaking your femur it's uh, that's a that's pretty serious yeah and our thing is if you look here um, you feel your hips you feel your ilium up here but down below you can feel your your um, what you feel here is the uh, uh, the greater trochanters of the, your femur. So a little anatomy, you should do the anatomy on yourself, you know, or, or a loved one, or no, I don't care if it's love or not, but whatever, that's someone else. You can look at uh, here, you can feel your little hip pointers being on your, your iliac crest, and then lower you can feel, oh yeah, that's my femur. Okay. All right, so speaking of patella, it is a sesamoid bone. And the definition of that is gonna be, it's a bone that forms in a, in a tendon. Uh, in an area where it's going to change direction or there's stress. So sesamoid bones can form in your body many places, but the patella is the big obvious one. Uh, the pisiform bone, one of your carpals is one. And then if you look under your big toe, you got two P-shaped little bones. Take a look at the skeleton, you'll see. Um, and those are sesamoid bones that form so that the tendon that's going to flex your big toe can run between it. So you're not stepping on it. And there's your patella. Yeah, right there, there's your kneecap. Um, you can land on it hard and break that one too. Um, but that's really what it's doing is it's taking the your huge quads, quadriceps, that muscle is gonna go through the patella and then it's gonna attach onto your tibia to cross it over the front of the knee joint. Uh, so it helps uh, change the direction and it helps protect the front of your knee joint. Yeah. Uh, here's one that's got uh, some cartilage issues, yeah. And you can dislocate your patella. Patrick Mahomes did that last season and, got, and you can put it back. Um, yeah. All right, your tibia. Tibia, wicked strong bone. All your body weight you know, it goes to the femur, but it's bigger. Tibia is smaller, it still holds all your body weight. And that's what you're gonna hit when you hit your, your leg on a coffee table and it hurts like hell, your shin. So your shin there is, uh, the bone is just subcutaneous, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and the fibula is not contributing anything to your body weight. See that? Instead of being up there in the knee, it's just below the knee, yeah. Well, looking at the tibia on top, you're gonna have uh, medial lateral condyles that fit with the medial lateral condyles of the femur. In the front is a big bump, tibial tuberosity, where that tendon for the quadriceps goes through the patella and attaches there. And then distally, that ball that you feel on the inside of your foot is the medial malleolus. All right, your fibula, small bone, um, it's not weight bearing. So sometimes in bone grafts, they'll, they'll take a piece of the fibula and use it elsewhere in your body because it's not holding any weight and you can, you can live without a little bit of that. Um, uh, the head is up here, kind of tucked away under the, the knee joint. And at your ankle, it's important. It's gonna make your lateral malleolus. That ball on the outside of your foot that you feel is gonna be the lateral malleolus. And it keeps that talus bone in there from moving too much. And there's lots of ligaments attached to it. Ah, just cool. There's a cool series of x-rays uh, like this. That's, look, you know, here we've got all the weight uh, and high heels here. It's not going to be on the heel at all, but the weight's going to be down in the, uh, the distal part of the uh, metatarsus. All right, well, finally, we're at the foot. Um, really cool. You take a look at the foot here. You can see it's like the hand, but what the hell is it? Huge uh, calcaneus. One of these... Uh, 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 um, um, tarsal bones is huge. And then I'll have you learn the talus as well, but you don't have to learn these. There's seven tarsal bones. And then the metatarsals and then the phalanges are identical in number and, and how we number them to the hand. Yeah, so I do have you learn two tarsal bones, that calcaneus or your heel bone. And we'll see your Achilles tendon. It's also called tendocalcaneus to attach your calf to that heel bone. And then the talus holds all your weight, transfers it from the tibia to the rest of the foot. Yeah, so again, phalanges, identical to the hand, there's 14 of them. 
metatarsals one through five got it cool and one more thing with the foot i should say because the difference in the hand is that you have these arches you're going to have let's see a longitudinal arch, actually a lateral medial longitudinal arch, and then a transverse arch this way. And these arches are made by, uh, you guys heard new runners, of uh, uh, plantar aponeurosis. It's uh, like a, a tough ligament here. So these arches are important. Uh, if you, these arches aren't there, you're gonna have flat feet. You're gonna be, you know, pressing. It keeps this kind of spring to your step. So you should have arches going this way and arches going this way. It's important to normal uh, locomotion. I think we're done with the foot. And I think we're pretty much done except for a few things here. Uh, the fifth metatarsal, I want you to know, has a really big tuberosity on it. So that often rubs on shoes or it breaks off. And then one more thing when you look at the foot, freaking digit one is huge. So your big toe steals the show here. I know your thumb is pretty big too, but uh, in the foot, the other four toes are almost like helping you balance. The big toe gives you that power when you push off. All right, and a couple things, just a uh, big picture. Um, so when you look at our arm, for instance, I just want you to, to realize that if you look at you know, your cat or your dog and the wing of a bat or the, the flipper of a whale, uh, the wing of a bird, all these things are just modifications, just um, evolution that has happened to these same limbs. And see they're color coded here. And as I mentioned, if you want a longer limb, this uh, humerus, it's not that big, but you can see the, the radius and ulna, in this case they're fused. And then look at these, these uh, phalanges and ankle bones. They really extend. And that gives you that longer limb if you're a deer, horse, something like that. Yeah. And then bats, you can see they have big phalanges. A bird wing went a different direction. They have little phalanges, but they have feathers that come off it. So although there's very big differences between uh, a horse le leg and a human leg and a flipper, they're all from the same bones that have just uh, evolved. And then I had a student ask about you know, owls, you know, and, and uh, just one more thing to show you, looking at the vertebrae in the neck of an owl, uh, uh, there's many more of them. So they can rotate their head almost all the way around. And their eyes are so solid that they, they can't, we move our eyes pretty well, but they really can't move their eyes. So they rely on moving their neck. And so you can see they can rotate at 270 degrees. Yeah. This is how far I can do it, right? And then uh, within there, remember the cervical vertebrae, those transverse foramen? In an owl, it's much bigger because by twisting their neck around, you think they would twist that artery. But apparently they have air sacs in there and just lots of room in those transverse foramen. And so if you look at the neck of an owl, uh, it has the ability to turn all the way around with, with all those vertebrae. All right, so a couple little fun things. Uh, so lifespan changes skeletal system. Uh, a lot of this has to do with this osteoporosis. Um, with age, the scales are tipped toward the osteoclasts and you tend to break down bone faster than you build bone. And so, especially on, on spongy bone. So the vertebrae will start compressing. Talk about a vertebral fracture. Sometimes they don't do anything about it. It's just this compression. And so with that, you get shorter height after age 30, Jesus, wow, that's pretty quick. But definitely in the elderly, you look at uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 year olds and uh, they're shorter than they used to be because their discs are smaller and then their vertebrae collapse. And where else do you have spongy bone? Yeah, the, the, the uh, proximal parts of your humerus and femur. And unfortunately your femur takes the brunt of your, of, of the weight of your body. And so that'd be a broken hip. So it's a common fracture in the elderly too. Yeah. All right, there's a video I'll let you watch if you want. It's just really cool showing the human skeleton doing yoga poses and, uh, and you can take a look at that. All right, so there's the lecture on uh, um, the bones of your limbs, the pectoral and pelvic girdle, and then your upper and lower limbs. And again, you guys see the similarities and yet the differences, you know, our, our legs have evolved for locomotion and our arms have evolved, shoulder especially for flexibility, for climbing, carrying, throwing, and our hands and feet have evolved differently too. You can see real similar 
organization with the bones, but then they've just evolved differences for, for, um, for uh, different functions. You know, unlike your dog, you know, their front and hind limbs doing the same thing, right? Uh, so they're much more similar, but us humans have really uh, gone divergently in our upper and lower limbs. All right, you guys. This is the appendicular skeleton I gave you. Uh, earlier lecture, we did the axial skeleton. A lot of stuff on the skull and vertebrae and then ribs. So hope you enjoyed. Uh, combine these lectures with your labs where you get to actually see and touch the bones and uh, uh, you should be in good shape.